Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, NVH and automotive applications. Let's get started with a short introduction of what NVH is. If anybody, so when I was in my uh, fourth year bachelor's, I was unaware what of what NVH is. Uh, so just to get started, uh, I'll introduce what the term means and what it is used for and all those things. So NVH basically stands for noise, vibration, and hardness. So uh, it is basically a study of and how to modify uh, a different noise and vibration characteristics of a machine. So it can uh, this, today's uh, presentation would be just about how to model it for automotive applications, but it can be valid for like satellite launch vehicles, to trucks, to washing machines, to industrial machinery. So it has wide applications in all um, fields where mechanical engineering is uh, required and noise normally is uh, referred to as some vibration that is airborne and felt by a human and then vibration is uh, something structural bone or fluid bone which is again felt by a human in the case of automotive so it could be that in military applications it could be uh, felt by a sensor where and you want to reduce that so that could also point of view but in, in automotive applications we are mostly worried about uh, the human receiver behind it so uh, let's look at a quick mind map here of what NVH is. So um, this kind of give you an overview of what my presentation would be about. And uh, then I'll deeper into each topic. So uh, let's get started from the source of what NVH is. So what would be a source? A source would be an, a source of excitation uh, into the system, which leads to a, a vibration or a noise. So it could be a mechanical uh, source where, um, say, for example, you have a piston which is uh, smaller than the bore, the cylinder bore, and like moving around, slapping on sides of the cylinder and creating noise. That could be an example. Um, in case fluids, uh, it could be um, the wind that is blowing uh, around your car, which is creating noise because of uh, turbulence. And then uh, it could be all electromagnetic, which is now a new field with um, electric cars uh, that we have. So um, there it could be um, something like a transformer that you have in a car. In common, like we hear like a buzz from a, a, a substation transformer, right? So that could be um, one example of an electromagnetic source of noise. So we have generated uh, this noise. What does it do? Um, it basically takes a path to the receiver, right? Then I'll be talking a little bit about what paths it can take. Um, obviously, it can be through a our cavity, uh, for example, air cavity inside, um, or just um, a car goes by, you can hear the noise right there. Uh, it could be through liquids. Um, I couldn't find an example in the automotive field in terms of liquids, but say for a military application in a submarine, if you want to reduce the signature of a submarine, you want to look at how sound travels in the oceans or in, in water, right? So that could be one example for liquids. And then for structurals, um, you have it everywhere in a car, right? When an engine vibrates, it vibrates the chassis, and then you can feel it through the seat, right? So that could be an example of a noise is transmitted from a source to a receiver through a structure. Then there's another point of view of human perception. So this uh, we engineers sometimes neglect because we just see sound as some noise signature or a frequency signature that we know. But as humans, we see sound very differently. It's not just like we take a sample of all the noise that is out there and look at each frequency and just analyze that. Our mind processes it very differently. Uh, for that, we have to look at uh, how psychology is. And I'll be talking just a little bit about this um, and then how psychology is it and how we can come up with quantitative um, metrics to analyze the subjectivity our mind has about noise. So um, we as engineers are mostly concerned about um, how to model the paths and sources that we have, right? The whole theory that supports this modeling would be the vibration theory that we learned from our bachelors from fourth year third, uh, to fourth year. So uh, that vibration theory would be essential for doing testing of these sources and paths and for doing CAE. So uh, just to give you a background, we'll be 
diving a little bit into the vibration theory that we have. So um, let's go to some vibration theory basics. I'll be starting from the very basic um, model that we have, a harmonic oscillator. As you can see in the diagram um, on the right here, you have a mass which can basically move in the x direction. And then there is a string connected to it, uh, which has stiffness k. And then the other end is connected to ground here. So this will be a very basic unit of uh, modeling a, a vibration. Uh, because for a vibration, you need a store of potential energy, uh, which would be the strain in this case. And then a store of kinetic energy, which would be a mass in this case. And then the energy will exchange between these to lead to vibration, right? So the equations of motion can be done using uh, the second law of Newton, uh, where we have the rate of change of uh, momentum is directly proportional to the force. So in our case, we don't have our mass changing, but uh, velocity is changing, right? So uh, here we have a mx double dot which is the change in velocity into um, a mass and then the extra force that is applied to it. So um, this basically leads to the equations of motion. And as you can see, we have a x on one side and x double dot on the other. So a sinusoidal equation would be a good solution for this, right? We'll be able to solve this using a x equal to a, a cosine omega t, where omega would be the natural frequency body. A natural frequency is basically something that if you excite a, a body with, say, an impact load, it would naturally vibrate at its natural frequency. So we are not considering damping in this case because just simplify the equations just to get, get the basics right, neglecting thing. So in a multi uh, degree of freedom, system, what would happen? So this, the formulation we saw for a single degree of freedom system, we can extend that uh, using some matrix notation uh, to a multi-degree of freedom system uh, and then model it as an eigenvalue problem and solve for eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Eigenvalues would be the natural frequencies and eigenvectors would be um, the modes that you see. So on right here, I have a quick example of what a beam looks like. So this would be the first mode of the beam. Uh, it's a cantilever beam, obviously. This would be the second mode and the third mode here. And just as a general rule of thumb, for a linear system, uh, the number of modes would be equal to the number of degrees of freedom. So in the case of the beam here, it is a continuous system, so it, it will have infinite number of modes. So if you're modeling this beam as an FEA uh, body, right? So what will you do? You will discrete this into uh, small section beams. And then say if you have 100 beams, if you have 100 beams, you will have 100 frequencies that you will be looking at. So it would be an approximation of the system, as in it won't have infinite uh, mode, but it will get closer as you uh, increase your mesh and make it finer and finer. In general, we won't be uh, worried too much about these large number of modes. After, say, uh, about 5,000 modes or something like that, it, the frequency would be so much that we won't be caring about that. And of course, there is damping at higher frequencies, which will damp those modes out too. So, so just to take a quick overview of what damping is, damping would be a force that uh, decreases the amplitude of an oscillating system from cycle to cycle. Uh, so on the right, you can see um, a diagram, which is basically uh, has different damping ratios to it. So damping ratio of zero would be basically the system won't have any damping. And then um, as you go on increasing, but keep it below one, it would be under that system. It would keep on taking oscillation um, to a lower amplitude. And when you reach one, it will be critically damped. And then after one, the system won't be oscillating. As you can see from zero, uh, the two damping ratio curve here basically is, is an exponential decay to the equilibrium. So uh, in terms of just the definition and the uh, damping ratio, the damping seems trivial. But uh, it actually is a very uh, interesting phenomenon uh, for the industry because modeling damping and uh, depending on how complex the model is, it's a very critical uh, parameter you will be looking at. So on the right, I have shown you, it's basically the actual frequency upon the natural frequency so to one uh, we are basically looking at the natural frequency. Uh, and then on the y-axis, we have the amplitude. So um, uh, with no damping, as you can see, 
natural frequency would have infinite uh, uh, amplitude, right? But with one damping ratio, we would have some, say, of five hertz amplitude. But by changing it by another 0.1%, uh, we will see a big difference. It's The amplitude is basically reduced by half, right? Just imagine that you're creating a model and instead of putting 0.2, you put in 0.1 and the whole amplitude changes. So in general, modeling real world systems, it's a very, very critical parameter and it is currently not that well understood. As you can see, uh, it can be modeled in very uh, different ways, like it could be velocity proportional, where in the equation of motion, you just multiply the velocity term by a, a damping term, a constant. Or it could be modeled as a Rayleigh damping, where uh, it's basically the whole uh, damping matrix is proposed to sum of the mass and the stiffness uh, matrices for a multi-degree of freedom system. Or it could be a frictional damping that we have. So in general, a lot of work goes into actually a um, lot of experimental work and high accuracy ex experimentation goes into actually finding out reasonable values for uh, damping in a particular system. Uh, in a particular operating condition because change in operating conditions also leads to change in um, damping. So many of the models I have worked with for damping, we just basically um, get to some reason value uh, from experimentation and then tune that value a little bit to match experimentation. The initial model would be tuned uh, to match experimentation and then we would be able to make predictive outputs from it. So. So um, after looking at some theory here, let's look at some sources and um, some application point of view of the topic. Okay, so let's just talk about some sources that we have. So sources again, just basically excitation that we put in a system, which leads to a noise vibration. And uh, the typical sources of uh, noise in an automotive application I've listed down here. So just to take a quick example of the engine in this case to list out how many sources that we have in there. So let's start with the actual combustion. So when the combustion happens, there's a flame that leads to some noise. It, the pressure waves act against the cylinder or bore and then we have some noise there. Then looking at the slider crank mechanism that we have, the pistons are oscillating up and down, right? So that is leading to some vibrations. The crankshaft is again a perform a complex motion which is leading to some vibrations. That could crankshaft which is not balanced correctly is leading to vibrations. This is just on the bottom and um, the crankshaft could be hitting against the main bearing walls which is again leading to vibrations. Right, And then on the valve train side of things, the valve would be opening and closing against the cylinder head. Right, This would be an impact loading on the cylinder head leading to some excitation. You have the camshaft at the top which is again rotating could be imbalanced and leading to uh, more noise so as you can see just for the engine application not even the transmission just a few parts rotating here there can lead to so much noise right and uh, if you are looking at the transmission there are again uh, especially in here in the us with automatic transmission there are so many uh, planetary gear sets in there which can lead to so many different kinds of noises. And now with hybrids in there, there could be motors also attached in there. So you do electromagnetic generation of noise, right? There could be this myriad different sources of uh, noise that go into the system actually. Uh, again, from a CFD person, it could be wind noise that we might be looking from the side door, from the sunroof, the flow of air around uh, the car. Um, for a, a linear FEA guy, it could be the tires that are interacting with the uh, road. So all these could be different sources of noise. So from what I listed right now, it, it was almost like 15 or 20 different sources. And that's from the top of my head. Uh, actually, there would be even more than this. So now let's look at some of the paths that we have. So um, a path would be something through which um, uh, noise basically travels uh, to the river. In, in our case, in automotive applications, it's the human most of the times, driver. Uh, so mathematically, we are in control theory. Uh, can we also refer to as a transfer function? So a transfer function is basically a function which you multiply it with the, uh, the source uh, signal. And with that, you get the uh, receiver uh, function, rec receiver out. It's 
to just make it cool in the industry is also called a transfer path but it's basically just a path again usually multiple path a single source can take to the receiver so just to give you an example of say uh, a road noise right so the road noise source is basically rubber tire hitting the road and then it forming and vibrate two paths that i can think of in this case it basically goes through the the tire goes into the wheel goes into the suspension mounts and then into the chassis and then goes into the seat truck and then excites the seat itself right so that could be a source of vibration to the uh, receiver and another way would be the tire vibrating itself leads to noise in the air and that noise basically goes through the windshield say or through the door and then excites the internal acoustic cavity of the car and then excites the receiver for just one um, path that we can see that very multiple paths that we have so um but this is just in terms of the driver that we are considering right so there could be multiple different people sitting in there or uh, there could be passengers in the car we need to worry about for engage right so there could be multiple different receivers in there it could be a, a pedestrian standing on the side of the road which we shouldn't be disturbing too much with our car noise right so it could be another consideration so as you can see there are so many sources that can take and then so many rivers need to we need to be worried about so it's a big problem that we have in general and a complex problem to analyze